Hello students, welcome. Previously, lesson 11, form 4, topic 5, we were dealing with the first part of the chemistry of copper metal, where we have done the occurrence of copper metal and also the extraction of copper metal. So today, lesson 12, we'll be proceeding to the second part of the chemistry of copper metal. And in our class today, we'll be dealing with number one, the physical properties of copper metal, Number two, the chemical properties of copper metal. Number three, the uses of copper metal. Number four, we are going to do effects of extraction of metals on the environment. Then lastly, number five, we'll be concluding with the two extended questions on the chemistry of copper metals. So kindly stay with us until the end of the video. So to start the first part, that's the physical properties of copper metal. We are saying copper is tough, but fairly soft, red-brown metal. Number two, we are saying it has a melting point of 1,083 degrees Celsius and a boiling point of 2,582 degrees Celsius. It has a density of 8.94 gram per centimeter cube. Next, number four, we are saying it's a good conductor of heat and electricity. And remember, copper is a metal, therefore, metals are good conductors of heat and electricity because of the presence of the localized electron. Number five, we say it's very malleable and ductile. It can be easily cast and readily form and use. So next, let's proceed to the second part of our class today. That's the chemical properties of copper metal. We are saying copper is a weakly reactive metal. It forms compounds in two oxidation states. That's copper one and copper two. It is therefore forms copper one and copper two ions. And we are saying the copper 2 ions are blue, while the copper 1 ions are colorless. So we start with part A. That's the first chemical properties of copper. We are going to see reaction of copper with air. And we are saying copper does not react with dry air at ordinary temperatures. However, when heated in air, a layer of black copper 2 oxide is formed. And the question for that reaction would be two moles of copper metal reacting with one mole of oxygen gas. We are going to get two moles of copper 2 oxide, which is sodium. And we are saying if copper 2 oxide is heated above 1100 degrees Celsius, it forms copper 1 oxide, which is red in color. And the question for that reaction will be four moles of copper 2 oxide sodium if it is heated at a temperature above 1100 degrees Celsius we are going to get two moles of copper one oxide solid and also one mole of oxygen gas. So number two, the second chemical properties of copper, we are seeing reaction of copper with water. We are seeing copper does not react with either cold water or steam. When copper is exposed to the atmosphere over a long period, we are told it forms a green coating of basic copper to carbonate. The question for that reaction will be two moles of copper solid reacting with one mole of water liquid or steam. We can write gas there plus oxygen gas plus carbon peroxide gas. What we are going to get will be basic copper 2 carbonate containing copper 2 carbonate, copper 2 hydroxide. So, number three, we are going to proceed to reaction of copper with acids. We are saying copper does not react with dilute hydrochloric acid or dilute sulfuric six acid to produce hydrogen gas. This is because copper is below hydrogen in the reactivity series. It however reacts with oxidizing acids such as concentrated sulfuric six acid as well as dilute and concentrated nitric five acids. So we are saying copper reacts with hot concentrated sulfuric six acid to form copper two sulfate, sulfur peroxide and also water. And the question for that reaction, we are going to have copper solid reacting with two moles of concentrated sulfuric acid, which is liquid. We are going to get copper 2 sulfate solution plus two moles of water liquid plus sulfur peroxide gas. Here we can see some observations. The first observation, we are going to see the red brown solid dissolves in the acid. The second observation is a blue solution is formed due to the formation of copper 2 sulfate solution. A colorless gas with a pungent, shocking, irritating smell is formed. That's due to the formation of sulfur peroxide gas. Next, we are told copper reacts with dilute nitric 5 acid to form copper 2 nitrate, nitrogen 2 oxide, 
and also water. And the question for that ratio will be 3 moles of copper solid reacting with 8 moles of dilute nitrophic acid solution. What we are going to get is 3 moles of cobalt nitrate solution plus 2 moles of nitrogen, 2 oxide gas plus 4 moles of water, which are liquid. So we say next copper reacts with concentrated nitric 5 acid to form cobalt nitrate, nitrogen peroxide, and also water. And the question for that reaction will be copper solid reacting with 4 moles of concentrated nitric 5 acid, which are liquid in physical state. We are going to get cobalt nitrate solution plus 2 moles of nitrogen peroxide gas plus 2 moles of water which are liquid. So next part D, we are going to go to the reaction of uh, copper with chlorine and we are saying heated copper reacts with chlorine forming copper 2 chloride and the question for that reaction will be copper solid reacting with chlorine gas giving us copper 2 chloride solid. Next we will be proceeding to the uses of copper metal. Number one, we are saying copper is used to make various types of electric wires, cables and also electrical fittings because of its high electrical conductivity. Number two, it's used to make cooking pots, boilers, and condensers because of its high thermal conductivity. Number three, it's used to make coins and jewelry because of its hardness, attractive appearance, and highly resistance to corrosion or rusting. Then number four, we are seeing it is readily forms useful alloys with other metals. Such alloys include the following. The first alloy of copper is brass, and we are saying it contains 60 to 80 percent copper and 40 to 20 percent zinc. The next we are saying it is property include it is harder than copper, it is very malleable and also resistant to corrosion. Those are the properties of brass. The next what is the use of brass alloy? We are saying it's used for making musical instruments, utensils, and also radiators. So number B, we are having bronze. Bronze is also another alloy of copper. We are saying it contains 75 to 90% copper and 25 to 10% tin. What are the properties of bronze alloy? We are saying it's much harder than copper and it's also resistant to corrosion. Then what is the use of bronze alloy? We are saying it's used for making statues, coins, and also machine parts. Then lastly, we are going to go to the third alloy of copper, which is German silver. We are saying it contains 60% copper and 20% zinc and also 20% nickel. So that means this alloy contains three elements, that's copper, zinc, and nickel. So what are it is property? We are saying it is shiny and also resistant to corrosion. Then what's the use of the German silver? We are told it's used for electrobility. Next, let's proceed to the effects of extraction of metals on the environment. And we are saying extraction of metals involves several states. These states or the states involved include number A, we are saying mining of the metal ores from the earth's crust. B. Concentrating the ores to remove most of the impurities. But C. Rusting of the ore to obtain metal oxides. But D. Reducing the metal oxide using suitable reducing agents to obtain the desired metals. And number E. We are saying in, in cases of more reactive metals, electrolytic extraction is applied. Then next we are saying extraction of metals, therefore, has a serious impact on the environment. This is because it leads to land pollution, air pollution, and also water pollution. So we start with the first, we are saying mining. The first part, mining of the ooze from the ground may lead to gaping holes being left in the ground, hence it destroys the beauty of the environment, as land ugly holes are left behind, if not filled with earth. Next, we are saying if undesired earthy materials accompanying the ooze are carelessly disposed of, it may lead to serious land pollution. The next, we are saying light holes left behind after mining, where still under mining of the ore, may get filled with water, and we are saying this stagnant water becomes a death trap as children or even adults 
can drown into it. They also act as breeding sites for disease vectors such as mosquitoes. Next, we are saying dust produced during mining, soot, and smoke emitted from the machines pollute the air, leading to respiratory disorders. And we are saying the combination of soot and smoke in the atmosphere results in smoke, which greatly reduces visibility and may lead to road and air accidents. So next we are saying mining operations are usually associated with a very large amount of noise. This comes from explosives that are used to blast rocks, from crashing machines and from the huge trucks used to ferry materials in and out of the plant, hence leads to noise pollution. Next we are saying solid byproducts such as the slug, which is formed in many extraction processes, could lead to land pollution if not disposed of safely. Next, we are saying again, run of waters from heaps of unwanted materials eventually finds its way into rivers and lakes. Such water contains dissolved or suspended minerals, some of which are toxic. Examples of toxic materials which are known to have contaminated water supplies are heavy metals such as copper, mercury, lead, and also cadmium. So next we say most metal extraction plants use a lot of water for such purposes as concentration of the oil and for cooling. Such water eventually finds its way back into rivers and lakes. Washed water from oil concentration operations contain dissolved or suspended minerals, some of which are toxic. Water from cooling operations is usually hot and when it gets back into the rivers, it raises the temperature of the water. Warm water dissolves less oxygen, a situation that may lead to suffocation of aquatic animals. Next, we are seeing gases such as sulfur peroxide, carbon two oxide, carbon peroxide, and chlorine produced during extraction processes pollute the environment. And we are seeing gases produced during mining such as sulfur peroxide and carbon peroxide led to acid rain, which corrodes the building and roofs made of iron sheets. They also harm aquatic life. The next we are saying inhalation of carbon two oxide reduces the oxygen binding capacity of red blood cell hemoglobin leading to suffocation. So next let's go and see measures to reduce pollution effect by the extraction of metals and we are saying most metal extraction industries have put measures to reduce pollution. These include the following number one land refilling. So we're saying modern environmental laws require that after the mining operation, the land should be restored almost to its original state. This is called reclaiming and it's done through the process of landfill. This means refilling the quarries and tunnels using unwanted materials from the, the extraction process. But B, commercial utilization of the emitted gases. We are saying sulfur peroxide is a byproduct of several metal extraction operations. Instead of being allowed to escape into the atmosphere, the sulfur peroxide is recovered and used for the manufacture of sulfuric 6 acid in the contact process. And we are told chlorine gas is fed into the hydrochloric acid balance. But C, fitting chimneys with wet scrapers. We are saying this involves passing smoke through a water spray that dissolves soluble gases, for example, sulfur peroxide gas. So, but D, we are saying the use of electrostatic precipitators. We are saying these are used to remove particulate matter such as soot and dust from exhaust gases before they are discharged into the atmosphere. Then, number E, we are saying disposal of solid byproducts. We are saying solid byproducts such as slag can be disposed of carefully by either burning them or making other uses of them. For example, slag 
may be used in abating roads, number two, manufacture of cements, number three, manufacture of building materials. Next, we will be proceeding to the last part of our class today, extended questions on the chemistry of copper metal. We said we'll be having two extended questions, so we are in number one. So kindly have a look at the flow chart. This is how the flow chart look like. We'll be proceeding to the questions. So we're done question number one. We go to question number two. Solanas, that's the end of our class today. Thank you for watching.